everybody. Hello. I thought I did. Nope, I didn't. Cool. Okay. Hello, everybody. Hello. It's good to see you. How's it going? Good. Done. So awesome. Thank you. So, how many of you met somebody new? Quite a few of you. Uh, person there. Is it anyone? Yeah. Who did you meet? Who did you meet? Cool. Um, you know, hopefully you're making friends for life, all of that stuff. So, shh. Um, welcome to 1511, I guess, week two. This week we're looking more at if statements and some other cool stuff, so that should be good. Um, so I sent out a, a emailed out a feedback form to many of you, hopefully to all of you, at the end of last week. I got a lot of feedback response, so thank you very much. That was really awesome. I'm going to try and do what I can to address the feedback. The first one was talk louder. Um, if I turn this up like even louder, is that a good volume? Cool. If there are problems with the volume at any point, let me know, wave out, say something. Talk slower. This is a problem that I have in my life in general. I get really excited and I talk really fast. So I've made myself a sign that I will sit here and look at during the lecture. It says, talk slowly if you can't see up the back. Um, so one common piece of feedback was people either saying, hey, this is going way too fast. I'm really confused. What's going on? Like, I need more help. Or this is going really boring. You know, I'm bored. I know all this stuff already. Please move faster. This is a really hard problem to solve, right? Like, I can't simultaneously go slower and faster and make everybody happy, which I would love to, you know, make things perfect for all of you. I have some proposed solutions. For those of you who think I'm going too fast in terms of the content, not in terms of my talking too fast, I'm going to make some videos outside of these lectures that you can watch. They'll go through things like using the terminal and compiling a program, writing a basic program. So hopefully you can watch those yourself. They'll be slow and detailed. Hopefully that will explain all of that for you. And for those of you who are getting bored, I want to give you some challenges to work on. Unfortunately, I don't have one for today. I might have one for the second half. So let me know if that sounds like it'll be useful. If you have any other feedback, again, let me know. Um, another common one was, like, we don't know what we're doing in this lecture. You just sort of ramble on about this and that. Um, I'm not going to apologize for doing things other than reading the slides. It's really boring, in my opinion, for a lecturer to just read the slides. Shh. So I will be doing live coding and that sort of thing. But I will give you sort of a summary at the start of what we're going to cover. And so uh, I'll turn those lights off. Lighting. OK, does that make it easier to see the screens? Cool. Shh. So I've written here, after this lecture, you should be able to. And that's a bit of a lie, because this stuff takes a lot of practice to learn and to understand. But after this lecture and a lot of practice and sort of reviewing it and that sort of thing, you should be able to do the following things. Um, so create and use variables with type int, which we've seen, and double, which we'll see today. Use hash defines to represent constants in your code. Again, you know what that means today. Uh, do a flow control diagram for a given situation. So we looked a little bit at those last week. Write codes using if statements, so if, else, if, else. And write code using nested if statements. So soon all of these words will hopefully become clear to you. So some admin stuff. Number one, don't panic. How many of you still feel like lost and confused and programming's hard and you kind of don't know what's going on? A couple of you. You're not alone. I think some of you also didn't raise your hands. Computing, it's like learning a language or learning to ride a bike, I guess. You need to practice. You can't just read the theory of bicycle riding and then become a bicycle rider, right? So as you do more practice and you do more over the upcoming weeks, hopefully it'll become easier and less scary. Uh, second thing, the lecture recordings are on the course website. If you haven't worked out how to find them, I'll show you like during the break or in the second half. Make sure you have home computing set up. So how many of you have written some code from your personal computer, laptop, desktop? 
that sort of thing. So using VLAB or installing stuff yourself. Cool, so those of you who haven't, it's really important that you get that working as soon as you can. If you can't work on programming when you're not an, at uni, then it's really hard for you to learn more. Um, and a couple more things I was told last minute to talk about. Make sure you can access your uni emails. If you haven't been getting emails from your tutor from, I think Andrew Taylor sent a couple out over the last week, then really seriously get your email working. And talk to your tutor if you need help with that. Um, also, the course forum is a really great place to get help. How many of you have like, logged into the course forum, looked at it so far, maybe posted a question, maybe an answer? Most of you haven't. So that's quite concerning. You should definitely be using the course forum, like check it once a week at the minimum, I guess, but have a look through it, see what questions people are asking, because often there'll be questions that you have as well. But one really important thing there, it's for questions about kind of stuff we're doing in the course or stuff about computing, not stuff that we will be doing in the course in week seven. So if you have really advanced questions, then definitely talk to your tutor. Like, it's great that you want to learn and explore things. That's really good. But talk to your tutor about it. The course forum isn't the place for stuff that we're going to do like at the end of the course. But if you have questions about the current content or you know, computing in general, like, should I install Linux? Or why is computer science awesome? Or that kind of thing, those are OK. Um, cool, that is all the things I have to talk about. So we'll do a quick review of the stuff from last week. So hopefully this is pretty familiar. We made, well, you can have variables in programming, so they're like boxes that you can store values in. There are three steps. We declare the variable. We say, hey, this is a new box that will hold an integer called num. Um, so we have the type of it. Um, before we use it, we have to assign it a value or initialize it. And then at any point, we can update that value by assigning it a different value. We can also print variables out. So hopefully, you're all feeling pretty good with the printf hello world. We can also print out numbers. So you know, if we have int num equals 5, num is percent %d, that will print out the number inside num, so 5 in this case. Um, we can print out more than one variable. So we can say num1 is percent %e and num2 is percent %e. Um, and how this works is the, you know, the computer, when it's running this, will go, oh, I'm going to print this out, you know, print out num1, oh, percent %e. That means take a number. And then it'll take this first number here. So it'll keep going, you know, blah, 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 percent %e, get this number here. And then the order that you pass them in is the order that they'll appear. So if you have that one, that one, that one first, that one second. Um, we can also get numbers into our program using scanf, so the user can type a number in. Um, and remember, percent is really important. So scanf percent d, sorry, ampersand or and is very important. So we have percent d ampersand num, and that means put the value into num. And so then printing this out here would print out whatever value we scanned in. Um, the and is really important. If you forget it, interesting things will happen. I think we saw last week we got some really weird numbers. So basically, remember that. And compiling is the overall process we have from turning C code into computer code. So we write our C programs for humans to read. Like we have to follow the rules of C, but we write them for other people to read or for ourselves to read. We then compile it with the compiler. I think I've got a diagram. Yeah. So we then use the compiler, use DCC, to turn it from human code into computer code. And then the computer runs the computer code. Cool. And then we looked at how we can do different things in different situations. And so we looked at uh, driving ages. So are you old enough to drive? So we wrote a program which asked the user to enter their age. And then if they're at least 16 years old, print out, you can drive. And then whether or not they can, display, have a nice day. So the sort of key things here are the if this, then this. Um, and so the steps printed out, read in their age. If their age is more than or equal to 16, print you can drive, and then print have a nice day. And so here it is in code. Is that a good size to read at the back? Cool, I've added colors, so hopefully that makes it more readable, not less readable. 
Um, and so this is just the code version of that. Printf herald you. It's like a conversation. If I was having a conversation with someone, I would say, hey, how old are you? They would say, oh, I'm 16, and I would say, oh, you can drive. We've got to start out by asking. Like, you wouldn't start out by someone telling you they're 16, and then you're saying, hey, how old are you? So ask how old they are. There's no scanf here. I might have accidentally deleted the scanf. I'm so sorry. There should be a scanf between these two lines. Um, so scanf percent d age. Um, then if the age is greater than or equal to 16, print you can drive. And then whether or not they are, print have a nice day. Um, and so we can extend this further. I have a question. Did I talk about this bit last week or not this bit? I can't remember. Does the word else look familiar to you? Cool. Cool. And so we, we want to sometimes do things like if they're at least 16, then say you can drive. But if they're not, then say you can't drive, like kind of have the if this, otherwise do this. And we do this with what's called an else. So the if means, you know, if this is true, do this thing. And then the else means if it wasn't true, do this thing. So in this case, if the age is greater than or equal to 16, it'll print this out. And then for all numbers that aren't greater than or equal to 16, so 15, 14, 13, 12, and so on, print out you can't drive, and then print have a nice day. Um, and there's a flow control diagram, but I accidentally got the condition the other way around. So you'll see that in this case, we've said if they're greater than or equal to 16, print you can drive. This one I've just written the other way around. If they're less than 16, then print you can't drive. And so there are many different ways we can do the same thing in code. So these will achieve the same purpose. They'll both print out whether you can drive or not but they're written in different ways. Cool, does this all make sense so far? Cool, I got a thumbs up, that's good. Are there any questions about this before we go on? Okay, so you'll have noticed like we said the driving age was 16 in the previous things, right? And we'd call this uh, a magic number which means it's a number that the meaning isn't always clear. So if you know the driving age is 16 because you know the rules or you know, the laws, then you could, you could look at that and go, oh yeah, that's the driving age. But if it's some other number that's sort of arbitrary that you don't know what it means, you see this number in the code and you just think, oh, what does this number do? What does it mean? Um, we call those magic numbers. the numbers that are unclear. So we can, if we're using the same number lots of times, so like 16 in multiple places in our code. If we have to change that for some reason, if they change the law to 18, we'd have to change it in all of the places in our code separately. And it's really easy to miss one. And so what we can do instead is we can say, hey, I've got this thing called the minimum driving age or min driving age. And whenever you see this, is actually equal to 16. And so then if we had a program that had if age is less than or equal to minimum driving age, we could easily change it to be a different driving age, which I have code for here, but I will do in VLAB. So this is really cool because we can both give names to these arbitrary numbers we have, and we can change them in multiple places at once when or if or when they need to change. How many of you have not used VLAB yet? Anyone? So everyone's used VLAB, but not everybody's used VLAB on their own computer. OK. VLAB is fantastic. I said this last time. I'll say it next time. You can log in. Cool. And so <clears throat> to get the terminal open, you would hit this terminal button down here. But I'm going to get a different one that's got bigger font. Cool. And um, remember, squiggle or tilde is your home directory, like your My Documents folder. And so I can change directory to that, and then this line is nice and short. Cool. So I have a whole bunch of stuff that's accumulated in here since last time. Um, but I am going to go to my CS1511 folder. So I'm changing the directory to this. I've got a folder called Lecture 3 already. 
C. So um, ls lists the files in the directory. I can see that I've got a folder in this case because I know what the colors mean called F to C. More on that later on. But what I can do is gedit uh, driving to .c. And so this <coughs> will open the gedit editor with the file driving to .c. <coughs> um, is this a good size, people up the back? I think I made it smaller. One thumbs up. Okay, um, if it's too small, just yell out later on. So components of our program, what's the very first thing we need at the top of our program? Yeah, I heard someone saying name, comment. So we have the comment at the start to say what our program is, what it's doing. So whether a user can drive, um, but then you have your name and then your ZID, um, and then the date, which is the sixth. Cool, and so now when someone looks at this code, they can see I wrote it on this day and it does this. What do I need next? Someone said main function. Before the main function, what do I need? See, I think you all said the same thing, but at slightly different times. So yes, a hash include, still a go to date, which gives me printf and scanf and other things. Um, then my int main void, again, I close it at the bottom so I don't forget. Return zero, I'll put that one there. Cool, so now I'm ready to write my program. I think I can just copy from this one. Ah, I, this, is, this is terrible code. What did, what did we do last week? I'm just gonna tidy this up. So looking at this code that I have right now, is this really easy to read or is it kind of hard to see what's going on? Someone said easy to read. I disagree, I think it's hard to tell what's going on. It was especially worse when it had this disgusting mess. So if something, printf, you can drive. Um, I'll get rid of those prints we had. Cool, <clears throat> and so our program from last time cleaned up a bit. Int age, so have a box to put the age in. Ask what's their age, get their age. Um, if they're 16 or more, print you can drive. So if age is greater than or equal to 16, print if you can drive, else print if you're not allowed to drive, go back to school. So let's say that the driving age changed one day to 18 because they decided, you know, 16 year olds couldn't drive well enough. I'd have to go through and change this to be an 18, right? So that's fine, there's just one of them. <coughs> cool, it's 18, it's done. But now my comment's wrong. That's okay, we could go through, fix it in all of the various places. If we had like other files of code and lots of other things down the bottom of our code doing this, it'd get quite annoying. So what we can do instead is what I said was called a hash define. So hash define and then the name for it. So in this case, min driving age, um, 16. And so now wherever I would have said 16, I can say min driving age. So I've just added that to my comment if they're over the minimum driving age. So when we have these hash defines in our code, how it works is when the compiler is compiling our code, so we're going C code to computer code, the compiler does like a search and replace. Have you seen that in editors before? Like you kind of go search, replace, or find and replace, and it effectively changes min driving age to 16. So it effectively runs this across our code and then gives it to the, like, gives it to the computer. So the word min driving age doesn't appear in your final code, but it means that when you're reading the code as a human and when you're changing it later on, working with someone else's code and so on, you can see in that that this is looking for the minimum driving age. <coughs> cool, does that make sense so far? 
Question or pointing? Pointing. Cool. Question. Cool. So that's a good question. Could I just use a variable rather than something like this hash define? The answer is yes, I could, but it's not as nice for several reasons. So I could do something here like int min driving age equals 16. But variables can be changed in our code, and maybe I accidentally changed later on the min driving age to not be 16. So because this can be changed, it's safer to use something like this. We can also tell from looking at it that this is like, I don't know what you call like shouting snake case. It's all caps with underscores in it. And so that conventionally means that it's a, a constant that we've defined. Cool. Good question, though. So yes, we can, but I recommend not doing it. Cool. Any other questions? Yes. So how come I don't have an equal sign? Very good question. I'm going to put this down so I can see you. It's better. Hello, student. So the question was, why do we not have an equals like this in it? Or maybe also, why do we not have a semicolon at the end? And the answer is, this is just a different type of syntax, a different rule for how it interprets this sort of thing. So the rule in this case is, whatever we have hash defined, so this word min driving h, becomes the name for the number 16. Does that make sense? Cool. Any other questions? Yes. Cool, so why is this in capitals? It's a convention we use. It's not a rule. It doesn't have to be like that for it to work. But when we're doing it as programmers, we always do it like this, because then it's just really clear that it's a, a constant we have to find. Cool. Was there another question? Yes. Can it be characters instead of numbers? What a good question. Let's find out. Um, so I'll hash to find say hello to be hello, right? So in my printf, um, I could printf hello like this, right? But I might chuck a new line in there. Do you reckon I can also do this? Printf say hello like this? I've effectively like copied this thing in speech marks here and chucked it up here. Shall we try it and see? Um, so what I'm doing here is I'm just commenting out all of this code so that it doesn't happen. So that's another way we can do comments. But because it's blue, it doesn't happen to the compiler anymore. Cool. Let me shrink this. Cool. So I compiled DCC O thing to call it. And that thing I'm compiling dot slash driving to to run it. And it's printed out hello twice. So we can see this line here, printf hello backslash n, has done the same thing as printf say hello that we've hash defined up here to be hello. So it looks like the answer is yes, we can. Whatever we have in here will be replaced in our program with whenever we have this. Cool. Does that answer your question? Any more questions? OK. Um, I'm going to say, I'm just going to save this as an actual file so that you can look at it later on if you want. Um, and I'll put these in the link in the Web CMS course website to the lecture code. This will be in there after the lecture. Cool. So um, back to this. We have if and else. So if this thing is true, do something. Otherwise, if it's not true, do something. But what if we want to do like more than that? What if we want to have more than just this thing or this thing? It turns out that we can combine an else and an if to make an else if. So the syntax for that is basically like the else that we had, but also an if in front. So it's literally just gluing them together. So I can say else if 
let's say there's like a maximum driving age. So let's say you're not allowed to drive if you're more than, someone said 60, I was gonna go 120. So if you're older than 120, you're not allowed to drive. So we can say else if age is, I think I have a problem here. I'll do this for now, but I think this won't work. See if you can work out why it won't work if you're sitting there being bored. Um, but hold that thought while I do this. You can't drive you're too old. So the logic here, you know, if they're older than the minimum driving age, they can drive. If they're older than the maximum driving age, they can't drive, they're too old. Otherwise, you're not allowed to drive, go back to school. So this sort of looks convincing, right? Like we've got the check for this and the check for that. But I think you'll find it doesn't actually work. So it works for, let's say, 18. You can drive, have a nice day. But if I type in 130, that's more than 120, what should it do? What do we want it to do? Yeah, print out you can't drive, you're too old. What is it actually going to do? Print you can drive. You can drive, have a nice day. I wonder why that happened. This seems like a good, good thing to do with a diagram. Projected to. Oh, what? It stopped. <coughs> cool. So you can see in the code we have, I'll move that over a little bit. We've got shh. Um, if the age is greater than or equal to I'll just say min age for shortness on here. Um, otherwise, if age greater than or equal to the max age, um, so if the age is more than the minimum age, then you can drive. I'll make that a different color. Cool. Is that readable? Different color to show that it's a part of it. Um, can't drive. So looking at the logic we have here, um, let's sort of go through one thing at a time. So if your age is greater than the minimum age, you can drive. So in the case where we had um, 18 over here, is 18 greater than 16? Yes, so you can drive, cool, print out can drive, all is good. When we had 130, um, is 130 greater than 16? Yes, so I'm saying that you can drive. When actually I want to say that you can't drive because you're too old. So I've got a bit of a problem here. How could I fix this? Cool, so one thing I could do is switch the order of them. Um, I might draw one of those lovely flow control diagrams so we can see what's happening. So currently we're saying um, if the age is greater than or equal to the min, drive, otherwise if it's greater or equal to the max, can't otherwise <laughs> 
Cool. So looking at this zoomed out a little bit. So we can see we start out with our, um, if age is greater than or equal to the min driving age. And so that's our check here at the top. Um, if that's true, then you can drive. Otherwise, if it's not true, we go into this else if. We check if it's greater than or equal to the max driving age. Then we say you can't drive. And if that's not true, then we go and say you can't drive. So we can see the problem we have here is that we're always going to get caught on the top one if you're too old. Right? So Alana? Annie. There was someone else called Alana. I'm sorry. You're Alana. Yes, and you're Annie. Cool. My apologies. So Annie said, what if we just switch them over? And so using the power of technology, I will do that. OK, I'll zoom out a bit. So if I just swap them over, doo -doo -doo. Doo -doo. so now I've got to fix this up a bit. So if the age is more than the max, you can't drive. If it's more than the min, you can drive. And otherwise, you can't drive. So how is this looking now? Does this look like it's going to be more correct? Yes? No? Who's confused? Who's not confused? OK. A few of you. So if we walk through this now with our example from before, um, we had 130, which gave us the wrong answer before. So if we have 130 now, is 130 greater than or equal to 120? Yes, it is. It's greater than. So we say you can't drive. So we've sort of hit the end. Cool, that works like it should. Um, and if we had 18 from before, is 18 more than 120? Nope. Nope, that's like primary school math. Hopefully you know that. Um, is it greater than or equal to 16? Yes. Cool, so then we go down here and say that you can drive. So how would I change my code to look like this? What do I need to do here? Yeah, so like swap this one and this one. And then swap these. Actually, someone showed me you can. Yeah, if you have Alt and you move the arrow keys, you can move the line. That's so cool. A student showed me that the other day. Thank you, student. So we've changed this around. We're saying if the age is more than the maximum driving age, you can't drive. You're too old. Um, if it's more than the minimum driving age, you can drive. Otherwise, you're not allowed to drive. Go back to school. Does this look correct? Does this look more convincing? Shall we try it and see? Cool. So what should I enter to test if it works? One hundred and thirty? Cool. You can't drive you're too old. Have a nice day. What else should I check to see if it works? I think someone said 21. Cool, 21, you can drive. Have a nice day. What else should I try? 15. Someone said 50. 50, you can drive. What did you say, 15? 15. 15, you can't drive. Go back to school. I heard someone say 120. If you're 120, should you be allowed to drive according to our rules? So according to the rules, no, because that's like the maximum driving age. But then does the maximum mean you can't be 120 or 121? But in this case, it's saying if you're 120, you can't drive, you're too old, have a nice day. This is an example of what I'd call, I don't know what I'd call it, sort of like a, a boundary error, 
We know in this case that the minimum driving age is like the minimum and it includes it, right? So if you are 16, you can drive. If you're older than 16, you can drive. Does the maximum driving age also mean if you're 120, you can drive or you can't drive? So in this case, oh, someone said no. Well, it means either one or the other. Either you can or can't drive. It's no other options. So yeah, in this case, it's a matter of being careful about knowing what you're trying to achieve. In this case, if we say 120 is the cutoff, then this is going to be correct. You can't drive if you're too old. Cool. Are there any questions about this? Sorry, say that louder. Sorry, can you say that even louder? I heard, how do you? Hang on. Shh. Everybody else be quiet. Our types in a letter rather than a number. How do we deal with whether they can or can't drive? That is a very good question. First of all, let's see what happened. I think we might have looked at this last week. If we have a letter rather than or a word rather than a number, bad things happened. Um, we might not have looked at it, so let's see. Um, so what is your age? 56. You are not allowed to drive, go back to school. What? Computer doesn't know what 56 means. Um, What is your age? Banana. Go back to school. Well, computer's obviously not very good at this. Um, the question is, how do we like catch when this is happening and deal with it happening? The answer is, that's a really good question. I might tell you after the break, or I might tell you on Wednesday. Have a think about it. See if you can think about what could be possible. But otherwise, I think I'll leave it until next week, or until Wednesday, tomorrow. Does that adequately not answer your question? Cool. Are there any other questions? Ah, yes. Hold that thought. You're on the right track. Um, if you didn't hear that, that's fine. You shouldn't know about that yet. You have what this illegal knowledge. Um, cool. Any other questions? Yes. Hang on. Shh. How did, how did I change the lines? Um, so it's this really cool thing. You hold down Alt on the keyboard and use the up and down arrow, and the lines move. I learned this like yesterday. It's so cool. Tutors, are you watching this? You can move the lines. And gee at it. Anyway, that, I think that's really cool. Any other questions? Yes. Cool. So the question was, how do we make scanf into words instead of numbers? How do we make scanf into words instead of numbers? I'm sorry, the answer is I can't tell you yet. You could Google it if you wanted. It's, it's, it's a secret. You'll learn in a couple of weeks' time. Again, has that successfully not answered your question? I want to sort of not say too much about stuff that we'll see in several weeks' time, because it's sort of overwhelming if you don't know what's going on. Yes. In the, what was the word you said? Exam? Yeah. Um, so in the exam, will readable code be part of the criteria? In practical exams that are auto automatically marked, so like, you know, when you run auto test in the lab and it says your code works, your code doesn't work, we don't assess readability there because the computer can't tell very easily if it's good or bad. In the exam, in sort of the theory part, something where you have to write stuff other than in a compiler to, to compile it, unless we say we are, we aren't. In assignments, however, yes, we do definitely. You have to have good readable code in assignments. Cool. Um, in theory, according to my rules, you should always have good readable code, but you won't lose marks directly in the exams for not having good code. Cool. Um, 
Let me quickly see what I have next. Ah, okay. So I'll look back at the slides for a minute. So shh. we've looked at hash defines, and we can replace magic numbers or numbers that are not clear what they mean with words, and then use the words in our program to make it easy to understand what's going on. Cool. <clears throat> and here's an example of that in some code. Um, and sometimes we want to consider more than one option, so we looked at ELSIF. So, okay, in this case, we've, in this code example that I have here, we check if the age is less than zero, and we say invalid input, because you can't be aged less than zero if you've been, you know, a, a human who's been born. Um, otherwise, if you're less than the minimum driving age, you can't drive. Otherwise, if you're less than or equal to the maximum driving age, you can drive. So in this case, it says, shh. In this case, it's saying 120 is valid. Um, otherwise, it's saying invalid input. Have a nice day. So we've looked at the conditions sort of implicitly. I don't know if we've talked about them. So in maths, you have the, the less than symbol, right? It means less than, like the number is less than the other number. Yes? Sorry, I don't understand the question. What a very good question. I think we'll answer that after the break. Um, hold that thought. So shh, looking quickly at this, so in maths, less than, a number is less than another number, like smaller. Less than or equal to. Uh, in maths, it's got the line underneath the less than or equal to. But in computing, we have less than and equal to separate characters, because we can type those. Again, greater than or greater than and equal to. We have one. I didn't actually talk about this last week, and I completely forgot to. We can check if it's equal to, like if it is the same as the other value, with two equal signs. So like how we have less than or equal, greater than or equal to, we have equal equal. Um, and we can also check not equals to with exclamation mark equal. So this just means not equals to. Um, and so something that's really confusing is like with the equal sign, when do we mean give it a value? When do we, when do we mean check if they're equal? And so the thing to remember, if you want to check if something is equal, you use two equal signs. So if age equals equals 18, it's asking, is this equal to 18? If you want to make it be equal to 18, you just have the one equal. So age equals 18. So what do you think would happen if I had an if statement like this? No, if age equals to 18. You are 18. Um, I'll make this into a new program. So I have this code here. Hopefully, it's straightforward. What's this going to do? If the number is 18, if the age is 18, print out you're 18. Otherwise, print out you're not 18. So hopefully quite straightforward. Check if it's 18, print out, yes, you are 18. Uh, equals, equals, don't see. OK, and so let's test a number. What should I try? How about 18? You are 18. And if I put in 17, you're not 18. Have a nice day. But if I forgot to have the um, double equal sign, I'll comment this line out so that we have it for later on. So if I have this, if I have if age equals 18 with one equal sign, what do you think it's going to do? I heard lots of words that sounded sort of convincing, but all at once. OK, it's giving us a warning. Go away. I don't believe in warnings. So if I check, is, if you're, what is your age? 18, you're 18, have a nice day. What is your age? 17, you are 18, have a nice day. Uh, what is your age? 100, you are 18, have a nice day. Like, what's going on, right? Something crazy and weird is going on in my program. No matter what I type in, it's always saying that I'm 18. 
And the answer to this, why this is happening, is because we're saying make it be equal to 18 in the code. So if you forget to have your two equals and you just have the one equal sign, this is saying, hey, make it be equal to 18. And then if that's true, well, I mean, it is because we just made it be equal to 18. Print out your 18. So be very careful about this in your code. Uh, thankfully, DCC told us, like, hey, you shouldn't be doing this. Have two equals, not one. Cool. Any other thoughts or comments? Okay, I propose we have a break. Um, let's have an exactly 10 minutes break. Get up, stretch, walk around, like even just stand up and sit down again a couple of times. Wake up your brains. Cool. How's that? That's suddenly a lot quieter. Is that good? Too quiet, too loud? Is that good? So raise your hand if it was too quiet at any point during the last one. Just to check, like, was it too quiet? One person, maybe. Raise your hand if I talked too fast. Like, be honest, it's fine. I probably did. Thank you for being honest. I will try to talk slowly. It's, I just get excited about programming. It's, it's really cool. Um, but if I ever say something too fast and you don't hear it, or like it doesn't make sense, just say, you know, hey, Andrew, slow down, or wave your hand or something. OK, so um, a couple of questions I've had. So someone's asked, like, where are the lecture slides? I can't see your lecture slides. The answer to that is I don't actually put them up beforehand because I change them. Afterwards, and I make sure I delete the stuff that we didn't talk about and so on. But if it's helpful, you can view them now in sort of the dodgy, not necessarily finished format. And then after the lecture, I'll upload the proper ones. So you can read along with these now. And then to review them later on, there'll be proper ones. So if you go to the course website, you go to lectures, um, scroll down to week two, Andrew B, Tuesday slides draft. And then you get this thing here. So it's, they don't look like slides, they're just sort of rectangles, um, you can do this as well. So you can see everything. You can see what we're going to talk about later on. Ah, oh, spoilers. Um, and we won't get through everything in the slides, probably. I don't, like, that's not my goal. I have more on the slides than I'm trying to get through. So don't panic if we don't get through them. But if you want to read along, they are on the course website. Cool. Um, other questions? So I've had questions like both in shoots and just now about the lab exercises. When are they due? What do we have to submit? Do we have to do the challenge exercises and so on? I can answer some of these. The lab exercises are due Sunday midnight. Um, and Sunday midnight is a really ambiguous term. Do we mean like the start of Sunday or the start of Monday? So to get around this, we make things be due on Sunday 11.59 PM and 11.59 seconds past. So one second before it becomes Monday. Um, you can submit them using give, like I ran here, um, and it'll say in the lab exercises what the command type is. And this, oh, it's Saturday. I thought it was Sunday. I thought it was Sunday. It probably is Sunday. Maybe it's actually Saturday. I will ask about that. I'm pretty sure I was taught Sunday. Um, Another question I've had is, what do we have to do to get full marks? Like, what's compulsory? Are the challenge exercises compulsory? The answer to this is Andrew Taylor will tell you when he's completely worked everything out for sure. But at the moment, probably you have to, you don't have to do all of the challenge exercises by any means. You might have to do some of them to get full marks, he said this morning, maybe. So um, don't panic. We'll make it clear in future weeks what you have to do to get full marks when we have it worked out. But for now, if you only do all of the non-challenge exercises each week, you probably will get close to full marks, if not full marks. But Andrew Taylor will tell you for sure in the future when he knows, when we know. OK, I think that was all of the questions I was asked. Yes. Uh, do, um, do your style get marks? Like how, how 
Yeah, so the question is, does your style get marked in the lab exercises, like how good your code looks? I wish. I wish. In previous semesters, or last year, first semester, and in other courses, tutors mark your code by hand every week. And so they spend the entire lab marking code, and you get you know, five minutes per student if you're lucky, if everyone's there exactly on time. And that's not feasible, right? Tutors can't help you and mark your code. So now the correctness is auto-marked. We don't look at the code for style. Um, if your code is really terrible and unreadable, then I don't like that, and you should have good readable code, please, please. Um, but you won't lose marks in the labs for code that's hard to read. You may, however, make mistakes that are hard to find. So, um, question up the back. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Lots of people at once. What about you? Are they like compulsory or? So the tutorial questions. I'll pull them up here. Week two tut questions, not the answers, just the questions. So the way that the tutorials work, uh, there are lots and lots of questions. There are more questions than you will or should do in the tutorial. The idea with the tutorial questions, you should definitely read these before the tutorial. Like, please, 100%, everybody in this room, before your tut, open your phone, go to the course website, read the questions. You don't have to solve them. You don't have to complete them. You don't have to do them. But read them and think about them. Think about, this is confusing, or I want to ask my tutor about this thing, or this is hard, or whatever. In the tut, this week, I think all of the tutors are definitely going to look at this pass-fail one. Probably, if they haven't, it's quite likely they will. But these are not marked. You don't have to do them. You should look at them. Please look at them. We can't deduct marks if you don't look at them, because how do we do that? Um, but look at them before the tutorial. You go through them in the tutorial. Does that answer your question, wherever the person was? Cool. Person roughly behind you with a question? Was there another person with a question there, and you both talked at once? Okay, person over there. So if I heard right, your question is the VLab thing said Saturday midnight. Does that mean it's a deadline? Um, tutors, hello, one tutor is here. Are the lab exercises due Sunday midnight? Has Andrew Taylor said this? I think he said this. On give, they're due Saturday midnight. Um, I think it's probably safe to assume it's Sunday midnight. If you submit it on Sunday and you get a late penalty, I will tell Andrew Taylor, hey, Andrew Taylor, I'm pretty sure it's meant to be Sunday. Don't give them a late penalty. Um, tomorrow, hopefully, I'll find out for sure. But I'm pretty sure he said Sunday midnight to me and to the tutors. The system says Saturday midnight. We'll see. Yes. So in terms of the examinations, are they based on like tutorial questions or actual code? It's a tricky question. Um, in the final exam, like we, we don't ask you questions like, um, what is a bit? What is a byte? There's no sort of type out the answer to this like factual thing that you just have to learn. We test things like understanding. Do you understand what's going on? So we would ask you things like write a program, or what's the bug in this program, or what's, you know, what can you do to fix this program, or so on sort of thing. So unless I am wrong, which I probably will not be, there will be no memorization questions. So you need to be able to write code. Hopefully you'll be doing that every week. Um, but you don't, I hope, have to memorize all these little details. Cool. Was there another question? Cool. So the question is, if you make a mistake in your program and resubmit, what happens? The most recent submission is marked. The other ones are ignored, basically. Um, the system at the moment has a deadline for submitting. Yes, I said that too. You're not listening to my lecture. Tutors, they never listen. Do you want to? Oh, Andrew Taylor's lecturing. Don't ask Andrew Taylor because he's doing the lecture. But yeah, I'll ask him tonight and I'll get back to you. Um, but yes, when you submit things, 
your most recent submission is the one that counts. So there's no penalty, no penalty for submitting multiple times. Submit 100 times if you want. It's probably really annoying if you run it 100 times, but submit your most recent one gets marked, basically. Yes. Hang on, sorry. Shh. Uh, so is the final exam on computer, paper, or both? It's on a computer. Um, in this course, there are no exams on paper. Like, you have to write your name on paper, and you can draw diagrams if you want to, but all of the stuff that's assessed is on a computer. Yep. I'm sorry, I can't hear what you're saying. Right, so is the question, can we finish our labs before our lab time slot? Um, you can. So with the labs, many of the questions you should be doing with your lab partner. So things like, you know, pair exercise. Pair exercise to complete with your lab partner. If you do it by yourself, then you're not doing it with a lab partner, right? So you should be doing it with a lab partner. If you and your lab partner want to do it before the lab, then by all means, that's fine. But you should definitely go to the lab either way because tutors are smart people and they can help you with things. Was someone else waving their hand for a question? Yeah. Yes. Say that again. Can we have multiple conditions for an if statement? What a good question. Why don't I answer that? So um, while I have this open, this is the course website. You should definitely check here frequently. There's, you know, sometimes the tutors, or the lecturers write beautiful answers that are just wonderful for you to read. So, like, you should read my answers. They're fantastic, right? But please look at it. Well, there you go. Is it okay to not go to my lectures if you hate me? Yep, if there's space, it's fine. Yep. Um, if we get 100% in the auto marker for the labs, does that mean we get 100% for the question? I think so. Um, I don't know for sure, but I'm pretty sure you do. Uh, where was I? This one here. Close. Cool. So before we left off, we were doing if statements. Um, I had a couple of people ask me, can you put an if statement inside an if statement? Um, yes, you can. It's really cool. So we looked before. If you remember, we had the if statement where we were kind of doing it in the wrong order. And so it always said, like, if you were 120, it caught it on the, the 18 one first. Why don't I show you the code so that I'm not just waving my hands? Did I save a copy of it? I don't think I did. I'll just break it again. Oh yeah, that's so cool. Cool, so this was the code we had before, remember, and it didn't work? Because it wouldn't, it would never say you're too old because it would always catch in this first bit that you're old enough to drive. So if you're more than greater, than, greater than or equal to 16, it'd say you could drive, even if you were too old. Um, and so we could get around that by reversing the order of the if statement, so we checked if you were too old first. But we could also change it by putting an if statement inside the if statement. And so I'll go to the diagram. Uh, stopped again. OK, it's working. So we asked before sort of like, um, Oh, I probably have the diagram still. The broken diagram. Mm. 
let's just copy this. Technology is really cool. You can't do this with a whiteboard. Um, so we had before, I'll delete that bit. Okay, there we go. So we had before, if your age is more than the minimum age, then you can drive, right? And this was a problem because it didn't catch if your age was also more than the maximum age. Shh. Please pay attention, this is important, useful knowledge. So we had the problem where if we just checked if it was more than the minimum age, we didn't catch the problem if they were more than the maximum age. And so rather than saying if they're more than the minimum age, then you can drive, we can add a second check to after this. So if they are more than the minimum age, we can then check next uh, age is greater than or equal to max age. And so if this is true, then you can't drive. And I that might just fit if I do it over here. Um, and if it's false, you can drive. Apologies for the diagram, it's crushed into itself. So does this, <coughs> does this make sense here? We can check after checking it if it's more than the minimum age. Uh, we can then check if it's more than the maximum age. And if it is more than the maximum age, then they can't, otherwise they can. And then we would get rid of this bit here and just check over here. Can't. So conceptually, does this make sense? We can sort of start out by checking if they are older than the minimum age, but then we also have to check if they're older than the maximum age. And so we can do that by adding an if statement inside an if statement. Uh, So the syntax for that would look like this. I'll then move this down here for the moment. And so the way that an if statement inside an if statement works is it's just an if statement and an if statement. So if this is true, then we go to this code inside. And then the first part of this code checks if this other thing is true. And so um, <coughs> if it is, then it would do this thing. Otherwise, it would do this thing. So I have these two printfs that I need to put in here somewhere. Where do each of these go? One of them will go here, one of them will go here. If you're more than, <coughs> if you're more than the minimum age and you're more than the maximum age, what should we do? Yeah, you can't drive. Cool. Um, otherwise, this is effectively saying if you're more than the minimum age and you're not more than the maximum age, so you're within the minimum and maximum ages, you can't drive. Cool. And then down here, we want to grab our else case again for if you're younger than the minimum age. So we've sort of got the two things here. This outside if, if you're more than the minimum age, then go in here and do stuff. Otherwise, if you're not, then you can't drive, go back to school. And then inside this, if you are more than the minimum age, if you're more than the maximum age, you can't drive. Otherwise, you can't drive. Cool. Does that make sense thus far? Cool. So the question was, can we just like combine them into one and so check if it's greater than the minimum and less than the maximum. Um, why, yes, we can. So I'll save that one there. <coughs> so another equivalent way of writing this, we can see that we get into this part here 
if this is true and this is true. So we can like, literally write it out as that. If that is true um, and, and, and that is true, then do this bit. Um, else if. Check that else back there. Cool. And so if we read this out as words, right, if your age is <coughs> more than or equal to the minimum driving age, shh, and your age is more than or equal to the maximum driving age, so if this thing is true and also this thing is true, then print out you can't drive, you're too old. Otherwise, if you're more than the minimum driving age and you're less than the maximum driving age, I forgot the word age there, then you can drive. Otherwise, if neither of these is true, you're not both more than the minimum and more than the max, or more than the minimum and less than the max. So if neither of those is true, then print out you're not allowed to drive, go back to school. Cool. Does that make sense? Um, so I'll upload all of these after the lecture is done so you can look at them all. But you can see this is the nested if statement one, so if statements inside of statements. And this is the one where they're all sort of chained on one line. Yes. Say that again. As in, do you need this bit here, or, or do you need this half here? Cool. So the question was, in this statement here, do I need this part here? That is a good question. What do you think? You have absolutely no idea that's why you're asking me, or? Cool, so you, you don't think you need it. So let's, um, that diagram thing went away again. So that can load, apparently is loading. So technology is great except for when it doesn't work, and then it's like annoying. OK, so we want to check if the greater than or equal to min and less than or equal to max, right? So which values does this cover? What are like all of the numbers contained inside this? Or a, a short summary? It's all the numbers between min and max, right? So in this case, it's like 16, 17, 18, what was it, 2, 3. So this if statement here covers all of these numbers. If we then have our next if statement, uh, if um, and I drew those the wrong way around. And also that should be 120, not 220. So all right, so this is going to cover all the values more than the min and more than the max, which is 120 and upwards, right, to infinity. This one here is going to cover if it's more than the min and less than the max. <clears throat> and so this will cover all these numbers, right? 16 through to 119. The question is, do we need to have this bit here? What numbers are like not less than the maximum number? That's like 119, 118, and so on, right? These values here that are covered by this are caught by this first if statement that we have. So if the numbers are more than the maximum number, 
then this first if statement here will trigger. So if both of these are true, then this one here will happen. If this is not true, it'll then consider this one. So with the if, else, if, else, if this one is true, it just does it and stops and you know, doesn't keep going. If it's not true, then it looks at the next one. And so if the age is more than the minimum driving age and less than the maximum driving age. But all the numbers that are max, like bigger than the maximum driving age have already been caught by this first one here. Right. And so we effectively don't need to do this check because all of these numbers here have already been caught by the first check. And then similarly, this one here is going to catch everything that doesn't fit that condition. Um, I'll call that something else. Cool. Does that make sense? You first. Cool. So the question was, isn't it a bit redundant to check both of these? Because if it's more than the minimum, it's also going to be, sorry, if it's more than the max, it's also going to be more than the min. Yes, you are correct. So I can delete this one here, and it'll still do the same thing. If a number is greater than 120, it's also going to be greater than 16. Save that as version 3. Cool. There was another question, I think. You had the same question? Cool. Very good. Cool. So, um, so looking back at the, the slides, we can have nested conditions. So inside an if statement, we can have another if statement. Um, and again, like you have seen in all these, right, there's so many different ways to lay out the if statements to solve the same problem. And that's not a mistake. Like there are a lot of different ways to represent the same conditions in one thing. Cool. And so we already looked at these. We have ways we can chain things together. So if we want to check if two things are true, we use and and. That's like two ampersands. It's a weird character there. So for and and, both have to be true. For or, one of them has to be true. And for not, it has to be false. So for example, um, uh, like if, what's a good example? Right, so if your age is more than 10 and less than 12, print if you are 11. Then we can say if your age is more than 10 or your age is less than 12. So for the and, they both have to be true. For the or, only one has to be true. So like which, which values will this cover? Everything. Yeah, everything, because all numbers are either more than 10 or less than 12. Cool. And then we can also do not. So that's the exclamation mark. Hot equals, we looked at that before. Cool, okay. Um, right, and this is showing the chain thing here. So an if statement inside an if statement is the same as chaining them together like this. Cool, so, and this is just showing conditions. So again, if the first condition is true, do stuff. If it's not true, then look at the next one. If this is true, do something else. Another else if. So if none of the above are true, do this one. And the else is in all other cases. So if none of these were true, then do this. Cool. So moving on to something else. I'll switch that back to there. And this is something that I would talk about a lot and constantly because I find it really, really, really important. Like for me, when you're writing code, you don't just want to write code. You want to write code that's good, that's understandable, that's you know, reusable, it's not terrible. And so we'll often look at like what makes code be good code, and why do we care? So one thing is indentation. And this is something that I guess is easy to get wrong. I've added colors here, so it's actually quite nice to see. But you can see in this one, 
if this condition, then do stuff to something else, to something completely different. But they're all sort of aligned along there. Whenever you have something inside an if statement, it should be indented across, so across by four spaces. And so you might think for this one, like, oh, that's not too bad. But if we have if statements inside of statements inside of statements, like looking at this here, it's really hard to see what's going on. Like, when is condition four going to be true? Right, it's, it's jumbled and it's messy and it just makes me sad. Because if you have the good indentation, uh, every time you have an open curly bracket, go to the new line and add four spaces. So another open curly bracket means four more spaces or eight spaces. Another one, this will be 12 spaces. Whenever we have a closing curly bracket, we go sort of back to the previous thing. So this has a close and an open, so this thing stays the same. Um, but then like this one here, open curly brackets, this gets indented, close one gets indented backwards, and so on. And so you're, like, the if condition and its closing bracket are indented in the same line. Does someone have a question? Is that a question? No, stretching your arm. So, I mean, hopefully this is sort of convincing to you about how not having indentation is really bad. You, you want good indentation. Cool. How many of you have run the setup gedit script that I put in the lab instructions and made last week? Wow, that's so few. How many of you have not run the setup gedit script? <coughs> okay. I highly recommend run the script because it will make your indentation be like automatically easy, really nice. Indentation is hard to do manually, and this will help it be easy to do. So that is a very brief look at style. I will continue to look at style. So let's talk more about ints. All right. Um, ints, integers, they store whole numbers. So is there like a limit to the size of the number we can store? Like, can we store a million? Can we store a billion? Can we store 10 billion? Can we store what's after that, 100 billion, a quintillion? Like, can we store numbers that are bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger? I heard no one, then I heard something that might have been the numbers of the bounds. Um, so, I mean, the, <coughs> the answer is no, we can't store like an infinite number of values. If we wanted to store an infinite number of values, how would we do it? Like we'd have to, the computer has to have some way of telling the numbers apart from each other. So we'd have to have like infinite memory space to store all the possible things we could have. What is the maximum? Let's look at that in a minute. Um, is there a minimum possible value? Is it like zero? Is it like negative a gaj gaj gajillion? Negative something? Yep, because we've seen we can have negative numbers. And what happens if we go over or under? So let's have a look at this. Um, Let's delete all of this stuff. I'll leave the have a nice day one in there. You can continue to have a nice day. So let's have number. So So I'll write something to take a number and take another number and then multiply them together. Print f num1 times num2 equals, maybe I'll do, okay, so let's have a program that does this. It'll read in a number and another number, and then multiply them together and print them out. And so hopefully using this, we can work out like what's the biggest number we can do. So, uh, it's, it's still C. Ah, I changed the wrong directory.
There we go. Oh man. So it's telling me here, use of undeclared identify num1, because I didn't make a variable called one num, num1, I just called it num. So that is fixed. And so now I'll clear it so it's at the top, and I'll run my program. It's, so enter a number. Someone? 18. 18. Enter another number. 51. 51. OK. The math works, assuming that those are the right values. So let's have 18, and then let's enter like 10,000, 100,000, a million. So we can see 18 times a million is 18 million. Cool. What about if I do 18 times uh, 10 million? It still works. 18 times 100 million. It still works. What do you think the biggest number is going to be? Do you reckon this number is going to be too big? What's that? Three, three, a billion? Do you reckon 18 billion will fit in memory? I mean, will, will be a valid number? Spoiler alert, no, it's not. So what's happened here is it's saying um, this number here, 18 times a billion, cannot be represented in type int. So what this means is the the type int, the variable type int, can't store this number that's 18 billion because it's too big to fit in the number. And so DCC is kindly telling me, hey, this has happened, oh, there's a problem, we've stopped because it's a problem, you know, this is bad, do something about it. But GCC, another compiler, GCC, I'll call that int GCC. GCC doesn't have these things where it like gives you this false sense of security of everything being okay. And so if I run this in GCC, yes. What's the difference between GCC and DCC? So DCC is written for people like you, for people who are just learning to program. And when they have problems and when they have mistakes in their code, it's nice for it to say, hey, you've got this mistake in your code, this bad thing is happening. GCC is like, a real compiler for the real world that doesn't catch these things. So, I mean, they can both compile any sort of program. They can both make any sort of program. But DCC, the programs run a lot slower because they're checking all the time, oh, is this wrong, is this wrong, is this wrong? So they'll both make valid programs. Cool. Good question. So DCC stopped us. DCC was being like, hey, you can't do that. You know, what are you doing? Stop. But GCC will happily not stop us. And we can see here 18 billion is what? 820,000? 820 million. Whatever number that is, it's, numbers are hard. That's, that's not the right number at all. That's really not the right number. What if we do one times this number? OK, so that one fits. So 18 billion doesn't fit, 1 billion does fit, 2 billion does fit, 3 billion has turned into this strange number that's negative. What? How does that make sense? Um, to show you something cool here, um, So close your eyes and don't see what I'm doing because you don't learn loops yet, but it'll make it a lot easier to see what's going on. Uh, why one? So again, I'm, I'm, I'm not writing this code. It's bad code to write. You will learn this in future weeks. But basically, I've written a thing to just forever add one to this number. Um, actually, I need to num one. OK, and so now if I run this, um, oh, what? That was way too fast. Let's try a smaller number. Let's pick like 
Uh, well, that's not quite what I wanted, but sure. Let's just count up the numbers. So we'll let this count up for a little bit. This might take a while, so I'll leave this going and also do something else. Did it stop or did I just break VLAB? Man, come on, computer, you can do it. What are you doing? It didn't like me resizing the screen. Maybe I resize the screen first. There we go. That can sit there. I kind of need VLAB again to talk about the next thing. That's okay. So don't get too distracted, but feel free to look if I'm boring. So with integers, we can store whole numbers, right? We can store any number that doesn't have a decimal place. But if we want to store numbers that do have decimal places, we need a different data type. And this one is called a double for reasons unknown. But a double is similar to an int, but instead of an int, it's, it's a double, right? So we, dec we declare it in the same way. Rather than saying int height equals thing, we say double height equals thing. So this is an example saying, you know, making a variable called height and setting the value 1.65 meters in it. We're saying it's meters. To scan it in, scanf is the same, but instead of percent %d, it's percent %lf. And printf, again, the same, percent %lf instead of percent %d. I have just told you a number of facts, and you're way too excited by those numbers to pay attention, aren't you? Yes. Uh, is there a number called like big? Yeah, instead of big, it's big, then I think it's large in Java. Um, so we don't have num we don't have types in C. Shh. The question was like, is there a type bigger than an int in C? Is it called a big? We don't have types called big. We have longs, and we have long longs. Um, you will learn about those later on. This is going way too slowly. Um, Let's try that instead. Here we go. Heaps faster. Oh, it became negative. Now it's positive again. Now it's negative again. That's weird. that one running there. Oh no, I won't. I resized it. It broke. Cool. So let's leave that sitting there happily cycling. I'll make it be a thousand. Cycle slightly slower. So let's have a look at some doubles. I think this is the one that I want. So here's some code that's conveniently been written earlier. So how many of you have heard of like Fahrenheit and Celsius? Does anyone not know what Fahrenheit means? If you don't know, you're obviously not paying attention. So shh, Fahrenheit is like a different temperature scale, is that the word? Um, you can have a temperature in degrees Fahrenheit and a temperature in degrees Celsius. And so like 40 degrees in Celsius is maybe like 100 in Fahrenheit-ish, roughly. And so there's a known formula to convert for this. Celsius is the Fahrenheit minus 32 times 5 over 9. That's just the rule. But we can write a program to do this calculation for us. So we scan in an inch Fahrenheit, enter a temperature in Fahrenheit, so we enter in some number, and then it'll tell us what it is in Celsius. So let's give this a shot. I'll make a new terminal. Oh, it wrapped around and became negative. I didn't even notice.
Um, okay, so I've quoted F to C, Fahrenheit to Celsius. So in your temperature in Fahrenheit, does anyone actually know what temperatures convert? Let's Google like 100 Fahrenheit to Celsius. So 100 Fahrenheit should be 37.778 Celsius. So it's like body temperature. So if we type in 100, we should get like 37 point something, right? It's zero degrees Celsius. What? Cool. What? Oh, it's, it's cool. No, it's, it's not cool. It should be hot. Uh, Enter temperature in Fahrenheit 10, zero degrees. 100, what? 1,000. What's going on, right? Like it's always printing zero degrees. What did we see earlier that made it always print like the same number? If we set like, you know, if age equals 16, not equals equals 16, right? So maybe we have something in here that's going to something to be equal, not comparing, but we're not doing any comparisons. We're just saying temperature minus 32 times 5 over 9 is the Celsius, right? So this is an example of, I'm not sure how to describe it. This is an example of sort of like doubles and ints being, being weird and different. So what's the number 5 divided by 9? Yep. Um, yep. Yeah. So the number 5 divided by 9 is like 1.75 something. Hang on, what? That's feet to meters. <laughs> Google, what are you doing? There we go, 0 0.555. So, it turns out that when we divide numbers, like if we divide Four, so it's four divided by two, right? What's that equal to? Two. Half of four is two. What's five divided by two? 2.5. Like it's two and a half. But integers can't handle these half numbers. Integers can only do whole numbers. So what happens when we divide something by something else? We just get rid of the remainder. Shh. So for example, five divided by two in C would just be two. It throws away the 2.5. And so 5 divided by 9 is 0 0.5555. So if it throws away this, it's just going to be 0. So in our program, when we do this thing here, this is going to turn into the number 0. And so we're multiplying by 0, and so, you know, it's just not going to work. How could we fix this? Yes. Yeah, we could make them be like 5.0, 9.0. Why don't I open my fixed version instead? So, if